Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. It's so lovely to have you here. I have an awesome guest today, but before I introduce him, I want to just tell you guys about my longtime sponsor, Manscaped. They are the revolutionary electric ball trimmer. They can give you those smooth hairless balls that you've just dying to have without nicking or snagging your nuts. They've also just recently come out with an electric nose and ear hair trimmer because that is just as, if not more unsexy than a huge man bush. So go to manscaped.com and use my code Holly to get 20% off. Now, back to my guest. My guest is Isaiah Maxwell. He is one of the top performers in the adult industry, and he's somebody I've worked with quite a few times. He's one of those people that everybody just absolutely loves, so I'm so excited to have him here. So thank you so much, Isaiah, for being on. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So how have you been uh, during this quarantine? Obviously, a lot of us have not been working. So what have you, uh, how's it been for you? I think um, the first month, month and a half was probably the hardest as in mm-hmm. like figuring out how to cope. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a busy body. So I like to go outside my house when I'm working and I, and I come home at the end of the day and I fill up my days with errands and everything like that. And as soon as they shut everything down, I had to be in my house the entire time. But um, me and my dogs have got real closer since then. They think that I'm home all the time now. But um, but as the weeks went on, I figured out how to cope more. Like I jog more now. Um, I read a lot more, even though I, I used to read a lot back then. But now I'm able to like just sit down and read a book through without any problems. And um, and pretty much. I've been dealing with everything that's been going on. Today has felt like the most normal day to me. I was able to go to the gym earlier today, um, and that kind of just jump-started my day. Once I got back into the gym routine, I was like, all right, let's run some errands and knocked out washing my car and just getting my laundry from the cleaners and dropping some laundry off. And I'm getting back into a, a kind of normal routine as we go along. Yeah. I, I know. I actually forgot that the gyms just reopened. Uh, I put mine on a freeze just because I'm pregnant. So like, I don't, I'm not, I miss the gym so much. Cause like you, I need that routine. I need to right. kind of like start my day with the gym and then, you know, go and do all my other things. But my husband and I decided it's not the best time for me to go back. Absolutely. I hear you. Um, uh, first of all, I didn't tell you congratulations on your pregnancy. On your pregnancy, you know. Thank you, thank you. Now, man, and I was like cheesing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's it's super exciting. Um, it's crazy. I mean, you know, I'm 41 years old, so I wasn't entirely sure I was going to be able to get pregnant. We were like kind of trying, not trying. Right, right. And um, yeah, we're really excited. We're having a baby girl in October. And, um, oh God, it's so funny you bring that up because yes, we had a name, we had a name all picked out and, um, I really liked it. And then literally yesterday, one of my husband's good friends, cause for some reason, like all of my husband's friends are having babies this year. And when I say all, I mean like five different people and two of them are his best friends from like grade school. And so, um, yeah, so one of his friends had a baby yesterday and fucking took our name. Oh, really? So, yes. <laughs> I was so mad. So he's like, we can't name, because we were going to name her Cassidy. And he's like, we can't name her that anymore. I'm like, why not? He's like, because my friend just had a kid and named it Cassidy. I'm like, I don't care. I don't know your friend. I mean, I do know him, but like, <laughs> I don't know him that well. Like, what do you mean we can't use it? He's like, no. So now we're like back to square one. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you when you have your heart set on something. Uh, I know, and I started calling her that and like talking oh, to her, and now I'm like, "Fuck!" Could, could you salvage it for a middle name? No, because the middle name's gonna be Randall. Ah, check you I out. Gotta, 
<laughs> yeah, I got to keep I got to keep the legacy yeah. alive. <laughs> so, um, but thank you. Yeah, we're really excited. All, all my sisters have um, my mom's last name as their middle name. Oh, uh, yeah. See, that's cool. I mean, I, so I never changed my name when I got married. Um, and I don't know. I think it's a little bit unfair to force the woman to change her name to her husband's last name. I understand like I'm okay with the kid having my husband's last name, but I did want to keep some part of my family in there as well. So Absolutely. I feel like it's a good compromise. So, yeah, I dig, it. I dig it. Well, I can't wait. You can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I, I, I follow you, so you know, your life is interesting to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So back to you, as much as I love to talk about myself, um, we are here to talk to you. So you said that during this quarantine, you've been reading a lot more. Is there anything in particular that you've been reading that um, you, because I'm actually look for, looking for some new books to read. So if you've got any recommendations, hit me up. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I reread The Power of the Habit, which is a book I, I recommend to everybody who always try to figure out how to break a habit that they don't want to have and how to replace that habit with a new, healthier one or something more that fits more your style. Um, you know, I just finished reading um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which is a self-motivated type of book, kind of self-help. Um, and then I also kind of been diving into a little fiction here and there, um, I just cracked open the book, The Color Purple, which is a childhood classic movie to me. Like, yeah, that's a great that book. Yeah, at least 250 times. And, um, and, I, and I never read the book. And so now I'm starting to get into like the movies I used to love as a child and starting to read those books. And um, it's a really great book. I just I'm only about 25 percent through and and, um, and it's, it's just very nostalgic. But, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I love I love the deep dive in all books. I have a Juneteenth book coming in the mail, and um, whenever I hear something of a current event, I love to deep dive into the subject. So whenever I speak about it, I, I at least somewhat know what I'm talking about, and not blindsided by something that um, I haven't seen or read. But um, I believe in kind of. I believe I always believe in getting more knowledge. You know, like yeah, like. Like extending that knowledge, don't stop in school and continue to learn more about subjects and just to grow as a person. Like as soon as you stop growing, you're dead. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, so I've not been one who's really delved in a lot into the self-help book category, but I think that it's there's a lot of value in it. And I actually just last night started reading a book called, I believe it's called The Five Personalities. Okay. And it's about how people, let me look up the cover actually, because then I'll know. Um, it's about how people deal with trauma and how people get stuck in like certain patterns to deal with difficult times in their life. Right. And I think that we all know that there's been a lot of trauma that's been coming out recently Absolutely. Um, online over several different things. And so I thought it would be, yeah, the five personality patterns. That's what it's called by Stephen Kessler. And I thought it might be a good idea for me to kind of look into that and look at, you know, how people um, deal with traumatic situations differently. Because I think one of the biggest problems that we as human beings had, and I've said this many times, is that we always expect other people to react to things that we, we would react to things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like we think like, oh, well, I feel this way about something. Right. You should feel this way about something. But we forget that everybody has different experiences, uh -huh. um, grew up differently, different like biology, hormones, chemistry, like all that kind of stuff. So I'm always trying to help I'm trying to always look at things from a different perspective and have a more like overreaching view of everything. Okay. So. I'm, I'm very similar. Like, you know, I've been listening a lot more and there's a big difference between listening and hearing and um, hearing is, you know, just the, the action of hearing you talk and listening is the ability to want to comprehend what you're saying and, and at least understand where you're coming from. So a lot of times when I hear people talk or when I'm, when I'm listening to them, 
You know, I could tell that they're arguing from their perspective, but they're not trying to understand the others. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and that's become the problem with a lot of people. It's just like, you know, people don't know how to separate disagreements from, from what they're trying to do. You know, when people hear disagreements, they hear that somebody don't want to go along with them. And, and it's not a disagreement don't make a person a certain way or another, but it's just showing what they're trying to tell you from their perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, I like self-help books, honestly, just because it helps me put a lot of terms to like how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people argue so much, but they don't know what they're arguing and they're trying to get it all out, but they just don't have the terms to what they're trying to say. And so it comes up jumbo. It comes up misconstrued or like it comes up unable to be understand because you don't know where to, you don't know what the person is trying to say. Mm -hmm. So like certain self-help books, I just read just to basically cover the basis of the path that I'm going in and to make sure the path that I'm going in is the way that I want to go. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything that is opposite of who I'm trying to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a lot. This book kind of deals with a lot of that. What they talk about is that, you know, just because we fall into these certain patterns of behavior to help us like deal with issues in the world, it doesn't mean that we are that specific person. And actually, it separates us from our real self. Right. So do you think that social media contributes to that? You know, we see all this infighting and arguing on Twitter. And, you know, what people want to say is limited to 135 characters and the difference between talking at somebody online and talking to them in person, I think is so, is so different. So do you think that that's kind of part of the problem? Um, I think it's not so much part of the problem from the person who is writing it. It's more so from the person who's reading it. Mm. You know, too many times people only read the headlines or only read what they want to see. Mm-hmm. So it don't even matter how many characters you have. People are going to pickpocket every little word you say anyway. And if they see one word that they disagree, your whole argument is going to fall apart no matter how much you try to explain it. That's so true. So <laughs> it's not so much the the author who is having the issue, it's like the author is not, it's, it's failing to um, make himself comprehensible towards his audience. And, um, and the audience is just not giving them that chance and everything like that. I don't, I feel like when people try to give their statements or try to be heard or try to um, say their piece, you know, people are looking to fight them. They're looking to go to war with that piece. And like, people are just like, you know, like, this is my perspective. This is how I feel about it. And then when somebody disagree with that, it's like an onslaught of we should cancel this person or like we need to like whip them back into shape and teach them and this and this and that, even though somebody's not even asking to learn. Mm. So, um, you know, I look at people messages and I read them and I could I could see what they're trying to say and everything like that and I just try to come at it with a sense of understanding them and right. understanding them as a person and everything like that you know it always reminds me of a parent that's trying to communicate with their child but they don't know the type of person their child is <laughs> It's just simple like that, you know? Or, or like the child doesn't have, their brain isn't developed to the point where it can like, uh, cause you know how like a child hits certain points in their development where they, like when they're young, they literally cannot understand like compassion and empathy. Like they cannot comprehend anything beyond like themselves. <laughs> they're, they're just not capable of that. And I swear to God, I feel some people like never get beyond that. No, not at all. They just, you know, they grow old, not up. <laughs> mm. God, yeah, that's that's such a good saying. So how do you, because you mentioned it just now, how do you feel about cancel culture? Because that's really prevalent these days. And I swear to God, having this podcast, like no joke, I keep waiting for the moment that I say something that I'm going to get canceled for. Like it's a fear that I have because I realize that, you know, when we're kind of talking off the cuff like this and having a conversation, sometimes you say things that are misconstrued and you don't really mean, and then it, it just takes like one person to take that out of context and be like, this is what she means by that. So it's something that I think about a lot. Absolutely. Um, you know, cancel culture comes at, it comes in levels to me, you know, and 
for everybody that's looking for someone to follow, cancel culture is like in their they like it. And you know, they'll they'll they're willing to cancel somebody in support of the person they're following. Once you get to a level above that, you have the people that are not necessarily following anybody, but wants to make sure that you know what they're doing is morally right. So they'll research what you said and if it falls into a cancel category, then they'll cancel you. Mm-hmm. And if not, then they'll sweep they'll bypass it as is as if somebody's just angry at this other person. And then you have the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are going to do whatever they want to do. If this person is a value to them, then they're not going to cancel that person and stuff like that. So you'll find people that will make outrageous statements or to people that don't understand why they're still there. And like, for example, the Laura Ingrams, the early Don Lemons, the Kanye West of the world and stuff like that. And then because these gatekeepers still see value in these people, they still bring the audience, like people still got interest in what they're saying. And to the people that are just on that level of looking who to follow, to the gatekeepers, like the reason why they want to cancel isn't justified to them the way it is towards the people on the bottom just because they want to please the person they're following. Mm -hmm. But um, that's cancel culture to me in detail. For me personally, if I follow cancel culture, I don't. I always look into... um, quality products that I could always invest in my time and, and people and I keep my circle pretty tight. But uh, as in cancel culture, I, I don't really participate in it. One, because people have the ability to change. Mm. Um, a lot of times in the cancel culture, they'll bring up something from somebody's past. And I consider that we turn into a different person every five years. Mm-hmm. So like, to comment on somebody who was a different person 10, 15 years ago and trying to discredit everything they did to bury that personality to become the person they are now and you want to cancel them now, it's just, it's it's unnecessary to me. And uh, yeah. it shows my ability to show compassion. Mm. So um, I'm always, uh, I'm a, my major is in journalism. I have a degree in journalism, emphasis in public. Oh, really? So my background has always been research, um, research what you do. And mm-hmm. so I'm researching the people, I always like both sides of the story. And, and I make my decision based off of that. You I know, love I, that. I do believe some people need to go. And, um, yeah. and there's definitely like too many passes given, but, you know, that comes with the territory sometimes. I like the idea that you look at um, your place in terms of like how you view somebody, um, in conjunction with how they behave and you kind of like look at your reaction to something, um, and you kind of factor that into the equation of whether or not, you know, somebody deserves to be forgiven or should be canceled. I think so many people fail to look at their own internal biases or, you know, their own reactions. Right. So, I do want to talk about, um, it's really awesome that you have a background in journalism. So tell me a little bit about that. Like what interested you about that? Um, what was the greatest thing that journalism taught you? Mm -hmm. Were you going on that path before you got into the adult industry? Absolutely. Um, um, I picked my major probably sophomore year with the intentions of getting into magazine writing. Mm -hmm. Um, that's back when like, the Source was a really popular magazine, Double XL, and I, when, when people actually bought yeah, magazines, yeah, when you was in Seven Eleven to get a magazine, yeah, <laughs> and um, and so like that was my aspirations. In junior senior year of college, um, I started to get involved with sports, and I had an internship at the end of my graduation for the Boston Celtics. So my my plan was to pack everything. Um, and travel to Boston and just buy a place out there, try to figure out my new Boston life and like go that route. But then my senior year of college, I needed to intern in my field of study and I couldn't do Boston and be in LA at the same time. So I applied to a different places. And um, one of the comp- one of the places that responded back to me was a porn industry agency. And at first it was kind of disguised as like a mainstream company as like they didn't say anything was adult related, 
But as soon as I walked through the door and was interviewed, they was like, look, just to be straight up, this is the adult industry. We mainly deal with adult stuff. We do have some mainstream directors, but this is our main focus. And if you're okay with that, we could proceed with the interview. And oh, Wait, I, sorry, real quick. What was this interview specifically for? Was it for journalism? It was for a publicist. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, my emphasis in my degree was public relations okay. um, that fell under journalism. So I was like applied to pub- publicity jobs. And, um, and yeah, like I said, you know, they asked if I was comfortable and they caught me at the right time, right place. I was young, single, and was just like, whichever direction y'all need me to go, I'm down. And like, cause I was already preparing to leave life behind in California to go to Boston. So I was like, getting rid of all of my, um, loose ends and every tie downs that was keeping me homebound. So, um, yeah, just kind of getting into the industry was just a fresh start. I did my first year, year and a half in the adult industry as a public, as a publicist. So I did all the girls birthday parties, did their conventions at AVN and Nextbiz. I got all their tickets, their red carpet passes. I did I booked all their interviews and, um, and I just went to every event that the adult industry had and shook everybody hand that was there and was like, hey, my name is Isaiah. I'm going to be here. Like, get used to my face. Like, I'm, I'm the new kid here. Just 22, young, had no fear. People would be like, do you know who you just talked to? I'm like, I don't. That's why I introduced myself. <laughs> and, and now when I crossed over to be a performer, the thing I knew I had to keep was my first name, which was Isaiah. I was like, because that's how I introduced myself to everybody. Right. Like, the last name could be mixed up or whatever the case may be. But I was like, when you hear the name Isaiah, uh, hopefully it brings nothing but good memories to you because that's what I try to lead. And right. that's how I kind of like got around with familiar well, uh, familiarity and to try to like let people know when they hear my name and be like, oh, OK, this his name sounds familiar. Yeah, I know this kid. Yeah, bring him on. Let's give him a shot. He was always nice. Mm -hmm. So how did that transition from publicist to performer happen? Because that's quite a leap. Absolutely. When I was a publicist in the beginning, people used to ask me all the time, do you want to be in front of the camera? I I bet they, I bet they do with that face of yours. (laughs) I was just like, nah, you know, like, I don't know if I'm going to do this for a while. And like, this is a college thing and I'm just writing my book reports on it and blah, blah, blah. Like, Um, but after college, after I graduated, I was brought on part-time because I went to AVN and that's where I fell in love with the industry. And, um, and what about, what about the industry made you fall in love with it? Like what about AVN made you feel that way? Oh, it was just, it was just the parties of everything, the seeing people being comfortable with who they are. Like, you know, I went to couple of rooms that was just like had pools in them and all the porn girls walking around naked. And it was just, it was unfamiliar territory to me. And I'm like coming from Cleveland or coming from college where I used to go to Bible study <laughs> <laughs> and coming to AVN where um, like everybody is loose and free. I was just kind of like in culture shock. And so I was just yeah. like, Oh, everybody here is nice and free. I was like, all right, I, oh, I like this and this is good vibes. And um, after AVN, that's when I like started fraternizing with the girls a little bit more because I met more girls from different agencies, and so I was able to talk to girls that wasn't necessarily in mine because um, my first six months in the industry, the rule of the company was don't fraternize with the clients. And then, like towards AVN, I found out I was the only one following the rule. <laughs> so, so I was just like, okay. Um, I was like, and one of the girls from my agency, her name was Maya Hills. She was the one that told me, like, she was like, you know, a lot of these girls like you, and you're not giving them any time of the day. She was like, it's okay if you like a girl and want to kiss them, and this and this and that. And I mean, it was just as innocent as that, as like, if you just want to kiss them. And mm-hmm. uh, they would, because I didn't do anything. I was just like, I'm not supposed to. I, my job is on the line. I can't blah 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 and um and just like a year from avian to the next avian all the girls was just in my ear saying like you know you qualify you could do this and this and this and that and so i was just like before i make any rash decisions 
let me talk to a lot of the top male talents to see like their paths and what they did right, what they did it wrong. And I just talked to a bunch of the top male talents like Prince, Shawn Michaels, um, everybody that was in the game at that time, the Wesley Pipes, the Rico Strongs. And they just gave me advice on what to do, not to do. And, um, and that's when I, that's why when I got into the industry, I was a, able to avoid a lot of those potholes people find themselves tripping over because I seen it coming. I mean, I took at least a year of conversations before I decided to go on camera. What do you think was the most valuable piece of advice you were given? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I had to get over was saying no homo. Uh, coming from college, I will always say no homo a lot. And that was just a high school thing. Like no homo came out when I was in high school. And that was the, the way to make sure that um, whatever you do is not considered too gay. And when I got in this industry, Rico Strong gave me one of the pieces of advice that helped me become more comfortable with myself. I remember in my first scene, I kept saying no homo. Like, all right, guys, I'm taking off my shirt, no homo. All right, I'm about to pull down my pants, no homo. And then Rico Strong came. He was like, you know, you can stop saying that. He was like, everything we do is homo. And I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was just like, that makes sense. And I was just like, you know, like, and, I, and that's how I got over that. And um, I've never heard that phrase before. You never heard the phrase, no homo? Uh-uh, nope. Yeah, it'd be like, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's very high schoolish to me now. But yeah. But it carried on to me until I got in the industry, and, and the industry is what helped me get rid of it. Um, it's very homophobic word. It's a very homophobic phrase to say, honestly. But um, but yeah, you know, Prince Joshua was the one that gave me a lot of great advice coming up in the game. He the one that told me like how to approach different companies, like how to treat the girls on set, like how to remain professional, and like how to. Um, carry yourself and like, you know, don't be afraid to say no. And, um, and for my old agency partner and boss, T real, he was the one that was, he's the one that gave me everything I needed to make myself who I was. You know, he, he didn't necessarily give me specific advice on what to do, but he told me anything on his desk is available for my use. And I read most of the books that was on his desk. I went through most of his contacts list that was on his desk. And he never he never gave me any backlash from it. And he was like, this is what it's all here for. He was like, I, he was like, I have all the tools for you to make yourself who you want to. You just got to use them yourself. And he was like, I can't carve you to who you want to be. So mm-hmm. just that freedom of being able to utilize the, the stuff to make myself a a better employee, better um, everything in the industry, you know, I don't feel most industries give you that leisure, like access to everything the agency had to offer in the beginning that I highly doubt any agency that will hire on a new agent would give them that access right away. Yeah, that's, that's, and that's, you know, the role, I mean, in the adult industry, an agent is really also kind of like a manager. The two things kind of mesh into one. And I think it's really important that uh, agents give new performers the advice and the tools to help them be successful. So that's really great to hear that you got that. Yeah, not too many people give you that shot. That's, that's true. Okay, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about Isaiah's very first scene because I want details. (laughs) All right, hang on. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. 
In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, we are back. So Isaiah, you have now decided to take the jump from publicity to performing. So tell me about your very first scene. Who was it with? What company was it for? And how did you feel about it? Well, um, my first scene was given to me um, by Dog Park. And um, it was it was hooked up by Prince Joshua. He, he went to the director and told him to give me a shot. And the director knew who I was from different parties. And it was like, of course. And so I was thrown, mind you, I've never been in a threesome in my life before this. I was thrown into a 13-man blow bank. London Keys. <laughs> okay, I am like, oh God, this is such a common story, by the way, for those of you who aren't too familiar or haven't heard my other interviews with male performers, that almost every guy's first scene is a blow bang. And a lot of the reason is, is because if the guy fails, because if you've never performed as a guy in the in an adult scene, it is way harder than you think it is. So if you fail in a blow bang, it's not really that obvious. You can kind of like shrink to the back yeah, and know. nobody really knows. So like th- I hear this all the time. And um, man, I feel for you because that is a tough training ground to start with. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, it was definitely an experience <laughs> to, to say the least. Um, you know, the girl was London Keys. Mm-hmm. Like, you never forget your first, right? And, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I remember, you know, I came in there, and um, and as soon as she touched my pants, I got hard because I wasn't used to just girls walking up and being like, ooh, like, like, yeah. like dick. And I was just like, oh, okay. But um, when the scene started and everything got going, I was definitely soft, probably... 70 to 80 percent of the time and the time that i got semi hard um he told me to get in and like hurry up and get it before it goes back down but um (laughs) but the thing that saved me was i was able to pop at the end and i had a big pop shot and um every guy that was there thought i wasn't going to be able to pop and so everybody was like low-key waiting for me to fail and you could hear them chattering in the background like oh wow Diego, nothing's going to come out <laughs> and so like i think my pop shot is what earned me um my next scene and um and then it wasn't as intense as a 13 man blow bang i think it was like a five on one game bang and um and i just kind of figured it out from there but even in the 13 man blow bang it, it felt like a hangout session. So it was like I met I met all of the male talents in the industry because they were like 75% of all the black male talents was in that one spot that day. <laughs> and um, and it, it always felt like a hangout. So the thing I used to love about Dog Fart when they did their mass game banks and when I was there, it always felt like a family barbecue because you never see your co-stars on different sets with you. Um, as much as you would like. And the days that we all had to come to these 15-man blow bangs or gang bangs or whatever we were scheduled for, it was like our time to catch up. So, like, a lot of time, all the OG guys that used to be there, um, I used to always hang out. I was always that kid that always wanted to hang out with the older kids. And um, that's how I learned more techniques and stuff like that. And just was just hanging out with the, the OGs of the groups and just, like, learning learning from them i'm a sponge i love to soak up information so i'm always just like all right what got you here like what do you do and like how can i implement that for myself (laughs) yeah you know it's kind of funny that environment that you describe is something that's i think a lot of people don't expect from like a gangbang scenario or something like that but remember when we shot that gangbang for lisa ann 
Yeah. And like, so one of my favorite things about that and one of the, the things that I wish was like kind of captured like in BTS was how, you know, we're in the scene, everybody's fucking her. It's like pretty hardcore and it feels really aggressive. And then we break and then everyone's like talking about sports and like their new favorite TV show. And it like, it just shifts from this like intense sexual experience to like this hangout. And that's literally what it's like. And the kind of like sense of like family and community is actually really endearing. And I I wish more people kind of saw that side because, you know, people watch these gangbangs and they think like, oh, this is so intense and hardcore. This poor girl's being like victimized. And like, this is, you know, like such an aggressive thing, but it's actually a lot of times, you know, if obviously it's different on different sets with different directors and producers, but a lot of times it's just like, it's, it's so different, you know, than what people think it is. No, I hear you. I mean, a lot of thing, a lot of um, a lot of things that people fail to realize about this industry is like, even though we're a small community, we're family oriented. Is what I kind of vibe the most with this industry. Is like, as family oriented as you think we're not, we actually are. And the reason why I say that is because when I first got in the industry, I was just a publicist. I lost half of my friends off back just because I was in the adult industry. I mean, I would, people were like, you're interning where? Oh, no, I can't mess with you. I didn't know you was that type of guy or that you was into that type of thing. And these are friends that I had deep conversations with for years. And I was just like, really? Like, that's it? We're just, just going to shut off? So a lot of times when you get these sets where it's like mass people involved or like a big game bang or so, you know, when you hear that intense sex goes to straight just to sports talk or whatever, the case is that we only have this limited amount of time to be with each other. So we got to get everything off our chest and catch up as fast as we can. Because when we leave the set, we probably not, it's probably going to be a while till we see each other next. And that time together is like the time we feel as a family, because we're all in an industry that we relate to. We all know what's going on. Not too many people outside our industry can relate to us as much as we are able to. And so we try to get all of those family emotions, all of that community building out the way when we're on set because we just don't have that as much as other people in different industries do. Yeah, there's something about being like the black sheep of the entertainment industry that I think makes us more close knit mm-hmm. as as kind of like this ostracized community a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, you could find family in this industry if you're looking for it. That's why... You know, even for Thanksgiving, what I notice is that if you invite a large amount of people to your Thanksgiving dinner, a good amount of those people will show up just because they don't have many places to go. Mm-hmm. And when I, we did our agency, you know, we would invite all the girls in our agency that um, needed a place to spend Thanksgiving. And like it was always the girls that you didn't think would show up that would show up, all the guys that wouldn't that you didn't see in a while will come and be like, Hey, like y'all doing something here. And just people want to feel that love and they, they want that community building. That's why community like building is so important to me and having us feel like a family is very great. That's so true. You know, I've never really talked about it or thought about it in that way so much, but there are over the holidays, especially Thanksgiving, there's a lot of, uh, adult industry like related parties like Brad Armstrong and Jessica Drake yeah. have their superhero Thanksgiving. I, went I think, there. yeah. So I think um, a lot of people was there. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. They always invite me, but I have like two families. I have my husband's and mine that I have to go to. So I'm like my Thanksgivings unfortunately booked, but I would love to go because it looks like so much fun. And then I know that. I think Greg Lansky did one. It might have been a Christmas thing last year. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, because a lot of people in the adult industry don't necessarily aren't close to their family. Not at or, all. Or, you know, they can't really make the travel right. to go go all the way to the East Coast or wherever their family may be. And so there's these kind of like organized holidays, which is just like, I just think is so sweet. Yeah. I, I tell, I tell my colleagues all the time. I'm like, especially when we get to November, I'm like, all right, I, I send out a text message to all my friends. I'm like, Hey, friendly reminder, everybody pay attention to your friends and your circles. 
around this time because I'm like November through to the beginning of ABM. I was like, this is the time where people are in their feelings the most because they can't be with their families. And this is the time where a holiday reminds you so much of being around the people you love. And sometimes people can't be around the people they love based on the choices that they chose to do. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm just like, as a friend, make sure you reach out to those people you love and just check on them and make sure they're okay. So How about the most impressive stories. How about your family? Are you close to your family? Like, do you go home for the holidays ever? Uh, I'm very close to my family. You know, um, if you have good family ties, I consider that a great safety net in this industry and not yeah. too many people have it. So I recognize my safety net of my family and their support is, which gives me the confidence to carry myself along in my industry. Um, I had to not go to Thanksgiving with my family last year to attend a Thanksgiving with Brad Armstrong because he invited me out for so long. I always felt bad that I wasn't able to show up. And I was like, you know, I see my family every year. Like I go to Cleveland usually for Thanksgiving and spend L.A. with my family um, for Christmas. And um, and I'm extremely close with both sides. I'm like I'm the one guy on both sides of my family that don't want beef with anybody in my family. So whenever my family and them are fighting, they have to come to me to see how the other person is doing. (laughs) You're like the mediator. (laughs) Like I'm I'm the Switzerland of my family. I'm just (laughs) everybody. And so, um, and and that's just because I'm I'm just a family oriented guy. Like I just, I I feel like, you know, we all have disagreements and that don't stop us from being a good person. So Mm -hmm. um, I always been building family bonds since I was a kid. But yeah, you know, I'm very close with my family. I talk to them basically every day. And um, I'm not shy to not answer or reply to anybody's texts. Mm. So I want to go, you mentioned dog fart. Mm -hmm. So obviously I feel like we can't have this discussion without talking about one of these incredibly important conversations that's come up in the adult industry right now, which is racism and porn. And I know that you've been heavily involved in those conversations. I I went to that ex-biz town hall um, meeting and and where you and a bunch of other black performers spoke about your experience with that in the industry. So can you tell me from your own perspective what it's been like for you? And do you agree with the idea that companies like Dogfart and Blacked should be canceled? Um, off back, I don't believe either of those companies should be canceled. I think without, without Dogfart specifically, you want to see half of the male talents that you love and learn about in this industry thus far. Black came about maybe, what, five, 2016? So, um, so like, they're relatively new. And, you know, they have brought in some black um, male talents that you that you know, the Jason Loves, um, and they, they've been good people. But um, without those companies, you know, you wouldn't have a real source of where people could film their content. Um when it comes to racism and porn, I always feel like it's been a reflective of America. Like um, the products that we put out has always been um, based on what sells. And, you know, I feel that from the time that I started with Dog Fart to the time that it is today, the company has just completely changed from the culture that they once was. And, and they, they adapt to the culture that is today. And with Black, you know, 2016, the name was cool. 2020 is not anymore. I feel that that comes more so with the younger generation and, like, what they don't like to hear or what they don't like to see. Um, But I feel like people from my generation and a little bit older are a little bit more okay with those words. It's not as offensive because, you know, we've seen worse. Um... My my personal experience with racism and porn was it started with the IR term. And when I came in as a publicist, I had to learn the definition of what IR meant. And so when people used to say IR, you know, I had to figure out quite quickly that they was talking about black people. And right. Inter- interracial for those 
So sometimes I have to remember that my listeners don't aren't that involved in the porn industry. So I have to like explain terms to people just yeah. to be clear. So what he means is interracial. Yeah. And can you explain exactly what that means? Because it doesn't mean necessarily what people think it means. You know, you would, you would hop in this industry and when you hear the word interracial, you would think that it just meant interracial as in like um, your ethnicity versus my ethnicity and that's what it is. But no, in this industry, it's specifically mean black male or female. And more so than none, it mostly mean black male. So the hype around IR is what was like culture shock to me of like how much it meant to the individual at the time. You know, people would put off doing IR f- for years, um, prolonging their career or with the hopes of prolonging their career. Um, I think in today's market, you know, with OnlyFans and other stuff like that, girls don't necessarily have to wait to prolong their career anymore. I think OnlyFans and their platforms help prolong their career. And so like IR is not as um, it's not as taboo to perform right away as it was back in the days because, you know, you don't have to hold off all your options anymore. Mm-hmm. And so um, end of the day, you know, I feel that IR always been a smokescreen for the word black male and black female. And I just feel like if y'all just be honest with what y'all talking about, at least we could be a little bit more clear and transparent of what we mean. Um, If I had to think about getting rid of the word IR in terms of marketing, I don't feel that it's necessary. I feel that's how people find their scenes. Um, IR is keywords to help you find something that you're looking for. Everybody do have sexual preferences on what ethnicity they want to see together who they want to watch have sex, and um, and what they like to see. Um, when it comes to IR and adult industry, I just feel like we need to get rid of that smoke screen and just be transparent. Um, the model, like if it comes from an agency level, I feel like the paperwork they give the models in the beginning shouldn't have interracial on there, and that um, they should just decide if they want to work with that person or not based off of doing their research on who the male talent is. And right. So it shouldn't be like you have a list of what you won't will or won't do anal double penetration right. IR like IR should be removed from that. And then people can be presented with, you know, a certain performer. Do you want to work with this guy? And right. they can say yes or no based on like whatever their preferences are. But it doesn't have to be like I won't do IR. I won't work with black people. Right. It's yeah, it I get becomes, you. OK. It becomes a pretext to people's beliefs. So. Right. Like for an agent that don't think that they're um, that they don't think there's any harm by having interracial on their model um, sheet to figure out what the model is into or not, it's, it gives a pretext to somebody belief before they even thought of it. So right. when people get into the industry and think of having sex, they just thinking of having sex. As soon as you present your skin color and be like, "Yo, would you do an IR scene?" and then it, it becomes that pretext of like, okay, what do you mean by IR? And then the agent got to explain, well, IR is black males. And then it becomes a belief question. It's like, well, what do my beliefs tell me? Should I work with this? Or is is it beneficial to work with a black guy? Or is it beneficial to not work with a black guy? And choosing one or the other is upholding whatever beliefs that person have. But that belief wouldn't even come into question if that question was never there. Yeah. And so, you know, and then when you couple that with the suggestion that you could charge more, you know, have your IR rate to charge more with a black man, that's like takes it to a whole other level. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it just kind of it kind of continues to uphold the belief that um, black skin is something um, less or more than the other skin types. Mm-hmm. And everybody should just be on an equal playing field and. You choose based off of who you want to work with and who you don't. Right. So what do you think that the adult industry could do to either make IR more palatable to people who still want to, you know, search for that that genre um, or like, like what, I don't know, what, what steps can the adult industry take to level the playing field and to make this a more fair, less racist industry? 
Well, you know, I guess you could say less racist is, is appropriate because um, what I don't want to fall into is the trap of calling everything racist because there are a lot of people that um, aren't in a position of power to change the things how we would like to. But there are people that are there that are trying to make sure we all get equal chances. So I do work with a bunch of directors who um, do try to give me my fair shot and do try to sandwich me into things that um, people would have to double look to see if it's considered IR material or not. But, um, but I just don't want to get caught up saying everything about the industry is racist. There are, there's obviously things that could make it um, less prejudiced than what it is today. But a couple of those things are understanding that um, what you're saying is what you're saying. Like black and white is interracial. And when it comes to the interracial market, people look for black and white instead of other races that are together. Right. So um, I think if, if the term interracial is that um, negative to the point where you you feel like you got to get rid of it to feel better, then I feel that it just needs to be rebranded because mm-hmm. the word the word itself is a trigger word because it, it's just triggering people for what it really means. But the word itself is actual is in actuality of what it is. So um, I think a quick rebranding of the word will probably help ease some people's conscience. Like, I don't have an issue with the word IR. I don't have an issue with BBC. Um, but um, but I do understand that, you know, some of these words are triggering to some and that sometimes they do need to be rebranded to, like, fit the culture of what it is today, you know? Like, mm-hmm. like... <laughs> Like when you try to argue the NAACP and people always think of like the first word is um, or the last two words of color people. And people wanted to rebrand that and be like, yo, we don't want to no longer call ourselves color people. But I mean, it's like history is this history. It's just that sometimes stuff needs to be rebranded to become better on ease of people conscious when they want to support it. Right, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. This is all, uh, this is, this is, I, I love that, you know, everybody's kind of got a different perspective on this, you know, different African American performers have different perspectives on, you know, how to change the industry. And, um, and I think it's just something important for all of us to listen to and, and see just how we can make it a fairer place for everybody, Yes. you know, absolutely. So I appreciate your perspective. No, I'm definitely a system guy versus an individual guy, as in, like, I support systems that give an even playing field. When it comes to Mm -hmm. individual stories, I take my time to listen to their story to make my decision on that. Because I do think some people do mess up on their own. (laughs) Yeah. Ways that it could have been avoided or, like, or I feel like some situations are, um, are, um, what is that word? Um, I'm trying to think of it. It's like basically, um, I, I know people are going to see this and be like, I know what you're trying to say. I know. It, this happens to me all the time. I'm like, I have that word and it's the perfect word to describe what I'm talking about. And I can't fucking remember what it is. Yeah. But, um, uh, it's like when somebody encourage you to do something you don't want to do, but it was such a simple word that it's just my fart. But, but yeah, you know, some of these situations are just a little bit more encouraged to be bad than others. And it's like, it's unnecessary that that has to come about when there's steps that could have been able to deescalate the situation. Right, right, right. All right. So I want to ask you some questions just generally as a male performer, because that is, as I mentioned before, one of the most difficult jobs. And I think a lot of people don't recognize that. So how do you handle a situation if you get to set and you are like not vibing with the girl um, and you're not really feeling all that into it or that attracted to her? How do you manage that? How do you still like get it up and perform in a situation like that? Oh, okay. Um, 
first thing first, the word I was thinking of is provoke. <laughs> ah, provoked. <laughs> Got it. Uh, this I, I read a lot, so I just didn't, I just didn't want to fail myself. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to girls that I'm not into, um, those are sometimes the easiest days for me. And the reason why is because um, I'm a fan of sex. I'm a nympho. So I'm just a true nympho. I just, I love sex. I love everything that comes with it. The fluids, the smells, the body, the connection, everything involved with sex. So just me having sex is what gets, what keeps me hard. Um, when it comes to girls that I'm not into or that I'm not vibing with, um, those are some of the easiest days. And the reason why is because I don't have to impress the girl off camera. And what I mean by that is like a lot of times when I work with girls that are my type and stuff like that, I usually I usually try to entertain them in order to remain their friends afterwards and have that connection after the scene and like continue our relationships and like try to vibe way after the cameras turn off. But if there's a girl that is not into me, you know, got everything, she's here for the check, she may be married, whatever the case may be. I know that I don't have to impress her to try to go home with her after the scene. So my job is simply to have sex and then go home. And that is kind of why I'm there. <laughs> so for every girl that I don't have to like give my personal background story to make sure that they like me as a person, it's cool. It's just like all I got to do is just focus on having the sex and and then I could go home and enjoy that that short amount of sex time that I had with her and be content with that. Um, especially when, a, when I'm not vibing with a girl, but she's extremely hot. Like I like that the most. I'd be like, Oh, I'm like, you're, I'm like, you're still too, I'm like, you're too hot for me not to want to fuck. So <laughs> I'm like, trust me, that is not going to kill my wood. <laughs> like I had girls that didn't talk to me unless if I initiated the conversation. And yeah, it's like it's cool. Your boobs are way too perfect. I'll just be focused on those when the camera turned on. I'm like, it's fine. Like, I'll that's interesting. It out. I've never had that response from anybody. <laughs> like that, that you know, it wasn't a problem. Guys usually talk about like, okay, well, I focus on one thing that I like about the girl, uh, and that's what I key in on. It's just once that once I see that there's not going to be like any friendship or any connection, I just be like, oh, I don't have to sell myself. Like, mm. oh, okay. I could just, I could just be a fuck boy. I was like, I could just have sex with you, and then just, yeah. I'm like, that's cool. I'm down. Interesting. <laughs> Who are some of your favorite female performers to work with? Um, you know, Anna Fox is the girl that I had my first assignment with, and um, she was a girl that I first took on the go see, and um, and our friendship has just has been that ever since day one. And so we have, we're just best friends today and like working together with her is always great. And um, that's so funny. I interviewed her last week and I asked her about favorite male performers. And I think you were the first guy she mentioned as well. <laughs> so clearly the feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's, a, she's, a, she's definitely one of my, if not my best friend in this industry. And, um, we always had each other's back, and I, I watched her grow up. She watched me grow up. Um, I like Riley Reed. She's a happy fuck to me. It's mm. like no matter how successful she get, every time I work with her, she's always been just a happy girl to be there. And, you know, you never – not never, but you sometimes get girls that you could tell that they're there for the job and not because yeah. they want to be. And so um, – you could just tell the difference in sex and stuff like that. And even though Riley Reed has became as successful as she is today and has all the money to not do this anymore, um, whenever you get her on set, it don't feel that way. Mm. Um, a lot of the girls that I just have more of like, a, uh, I look up to them as professionals and just like, I like, I like how they go about their work and their work ethics, you know, Kendra Sutherland, Abigail Mack, Bridget B, um, Whitney Wright, um, Alexis Fox, Kendra Lust. These are just the girls. Um, 
that when I think of their work ethics are just extremely high. And so like when you when you think of like how they got to where they are, it's not just because they look good. It's just because they put in the work to get there. And like and it's like I hear like certain girls that are pretty or just as pretty as them and they like how come I'm not there and then I listen to what they do and it's just like, well, you're not putting in as much work as these girls do. Like they do this mostly almost every day and they continue to continue, they continue to go. So. um, Yeah. I think one of the mistakes that people make getting into the adult industry is that they think that it's like incredibly easy and all they have to do is show up and have sex and that's it. So like they think like, Oh, this is an easy job. And granted there are more difficult jobs out there in the world for sure, but it's not, you're right. Like there's a lot of hustle in the job, especially now with the new content platforms, OnlyFans, Snapchat, and stuff like that. Like, you want to make a lot of money on those platforms. You want to be successful. Like, you have to work. Yeah, you know, you got to you gotta stay up to it. If you don't have a manager helping you out, you still got to make the content. Like, <laughs> yeah. like then, even when you don't want to work and try to have everybody do it for you, you still got to put in a good amount of work in order for them to make you successful. So, um I, I just know that nothing in this industry comes free or come that easy. Um, or at least for the anomalies that it do, they just blow up out of nowhere. I always try to tell my colleagues, I'm like, those are anomalies, you know? Like, there are people that are going to come in that didn't have to work as hard as you and blow up faster than you, and that's just who they are, you know? Right. It is what it is. But for the majority of the people that are here that you see years on years, um, they had to put in the work to stay there. Right, right. Okay, I'm going to go to a couple of the questions that people sent me for you, like I mentioned. So um, let's see. Hold on one second. Uh, Okay, Uh, where is it? Okay, so Aaliyah Love yesterday (coughs) said I have to ask you. Well, first of all, she prefaced this with uh, that you're the most handsome man to ever exist. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, she wants me to ask you, and apparently I have to say it specifically like this. I got to ask you, how's that dick? (laughs) Does that mean anything to you or is that just Aaliyah being cute? That's just Aaliyah being cute. Um, Aaliyah is a name I should have mentioned along with the girls that I um, said are my top performers as well. Uh, the first time me and Aaliyah had a scene together, it was probably one of the best scenes that I ever had, especially right out the gate for a director I love working with, Mason. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because that scene itself, I always not, I always try to not perform my best the first time I meet a director because they'll always expect that from you. The <laughs> when he performs. One of the best pieces of advice that I got actually from my set designer was never give a hundred percent because you can only go down from there. Yeah, so I was like, you know, I've always been like that lower expectation type of guy. Like, oh, I thought I was going to get a C, but I actually got an A minus. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but Aaliyah made me look my best to Mason. And so, like, every time Mason's hired me, she looks for that performance I gave with Aaliyah. And I was like, well, Aaliyah brought that out of me. And, yeah. um, and she's just like, you know, her her aura is so good. I was like, you know, I went to her birthday parties when she threw them. And uh, she's always been a kind spirit, always smiling. And... You know, like my dick is always good. It's it's good. You know, when it comes to how my dick is, you know, it's always ready for like one power round a day, <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like ready for like three more. Like if you want to go for it again, let's do it. And um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm like I like. So, so speaking of your dick, like this uh, next question kind of applies to it. Uh, Eva asks, will you ask Mr. Maxwell about his dating style outside of the industry? Is he monogamous outside of work or is he have more of a poly mindset? I find it interesting as so many performers have their own ideology about sexuality and love outside of work that varies from performer to performer. Um, also is it difficult to date outside of the industry when people find out that he's important? P.S. He's mega hot. I want him in my gangbang. (laughs) 
<laughs> so well, I'm happy to be there. If, I, if I'm there, I'd love to come. <laughs> I've been promising her ever since I hired her. I've been promising her like a gangbang for her birthday with her favorite male performers. And so like as she gets to know people in the industry, she like adds people to that list. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to follow through on it, but... It's it's kind of like a private joke between us. It's all good. You know, I'll be ready for when that call comes in. <laughs> um, I'm definitely more of a poly mindset now than I was when I first got into business, in which I was more monogamous. Or I thought I had to be more monogamous. See, I always fought with monogamy and um, polyamorous. And I found out that I'm just I'm more comfortable with myself if I'm poly. And if my partner's poly as well, I, I feel that it's natural for us to be attracted to other people and like have impulses that we would like to act on. And I feel that failing to act on those impulses make us um, digress into who we want to be as a person. Um, <laughs> personally, when it comes to dating, when I started in this industry, I started off with a girlfriend and um and I felt like as my popularity rose, it was starting to become more difficult for us to be in a relationship because she, she would start questioning like, why this girl? Why are you why do, why are you accepting this thing and this and this and that? And it's just kind of like my response was, I just want to be great. And um, and so our relationship didn't last much longer. And um, and when we broke up, I decided that. As long as I was going to perform at a high level, that I was going to be single. And the reason why is because I was just like, a lot of girls are fine with me, like dating me, um, doing this industry, and until they see me actually doing it. And mm. when they actually see me working and everything like that, they see how much I actually work. And then they start noticing it's like one or two girls every day. And so, like, dealing with those emotions, I always feel was a disadvantage to the girl and, like, hard on herself with who she want to be as a person. And so I've never tried to, like, place that on any girl's shoulder with dealing with me. But um, I just told myself, as long as I want to do this at a high level, that I, it's probably best for me to be single. It also makes it easier for my partners who want to work with me as well because they don't have to deal with any unnecessary drama that comes along working with me and stuff like that. You don't have to worry about any girls in your DMs talking to you or talking to you crazy. You don't got to worry about nobody coming after you. And everybody knows I'm a free spirit. So yeah, <laughs> like when I date, I'm just dating. I tell them it's probably not going to go anywhere. I'm, I'm not looking for a relationship. And some girls aren't cool with that. Some girls try to prove me wrong, which then becomes a situation that I don't want to be a part of because I feel like I end up hurting their feelings more than helping it. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm just always straight up with my female co-partners and um, I never lead anybody on. I never try to make anybody feel more special than they are. I don't tell anybody I love them and I don't. And it's really hard for me to lie to a person that says like, oh, you're my best or you're my worst. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dating anybody outside the industry is very difficult, you know. Um, it's just it's just two different mindsets. It's, um, mm -hmm. Having the mindset of being in this industry is just completely different from somebody who usually takes the time to get to know somebody and want to build that connection before it becomes physical. Mm -hmm. um, in this industry, it's more physical before mental. <laughs> so it's just kind of, it's a delicate balance of like um, trying to figure out who you are and what you want. But at the end of the day, for me, I always feel that it's easier for me to do my job if I just kind of stay single and be a good spirit and to whoever want to involve me in their life. Right, right. right. Yeah. One of my other questions was, I don't know if it's a question necessarily you could answer, but they just said, uh, judging from your Twitter feed, you seem to be one of the nicest guys in the industry. And is that true? Like, and why are you so nice? And I, I can vouch for having worked with you a few times that you are really nice and you have like a wonderful, gentle kind of, but yet like intense 
aura to you. Like you don't, you don't talk a ton on set. You don't come on and like run your mouth all the time, but you have a presence that's very palatable. <laughs> I hear you. Um, you know, when I came into the business as a publicist, um, I was always behind the scenes. So as much as all the stuff I love about the industry, I saw all the bad stuff that happened too. And it seemed like to me when I first got in the industry, this always felt like somebody had an artillery motive when they was dealing with you. And so a lot of times I would listen to the interviews of the girls coming in the industry and like the interviewer will always be like, you got to trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. And then they'll do something that goes against their trust. And then the girl will be stranded with like, who do I go to now that the person that told me to trust me, I can't trust anymore. So one of my principles in being in this industry is always be a good person. So um, one of my things is that I always wanted to be somebody in an industry that don't have an artillery motive. Like if I'm helping you, I'm helping you because I want to. If I'm nice to you, I'm nice to you because I want to. I don't have any reason to downplay anybody to rise myself up. I won't discredit any other male talents to make sure you don't work with them. I don't like to cancel out anybody's work. I don't want to be an influence of anybody being degraded or anything like that. I just, I just want to be that point of reference of when you think of me, you don't think I'm trying to get over on you. Mm. And that's always been my ideal of being in this industry, of being that one person you can't say, yeah, Isaiah is not trying to get over you, or Isaiah is not looking for something you have that he don't have. Um, I just, I'm just want to be a good person. And that's... You- you don't come in with like expectations, like kind of quid pro quo. I do this for you. You do this for me. Yeah, You know, if I do something for you, there's no nothing in return that you have to do for me. I never right. put that on anybody that you owe me something for doing this or I just I do it out of being a good person. I remember I would have girls who would call me and be like, I'm being kicked out of this model house and um and I don't have a place to stay. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give you my couch until you figure it out. And, um, and you know, I'll help you with whatever you need. And I remember this girl was from out of state, so I didn't think much of it when she said it. But when she came down, the Uber driver was, to his relief, was so happy when he saw me because he just unloaded this entire car worth of stuff that I had to throw into my place. And um, and so we brought all these things into my living room, and it was just covered up. And I was just like, okay, like we got, we're gonna have to figure out where to put all this stuff, or where you're gonna go, and this and this and that. And she was just crying and boohooing and everything like that. And then um, when she finally settled down, she was just like, so you want to have sex? And I was just like, no, I don't. And she was like, what do you mean? She was like, I'm here. I was like, sweetie, I was like, if I have sex with you right now, that defeats the whole purpose of why I'm helping. I was like, you, you need to chill out and just like hang out for a second and just relieve yourself of like being in a space where you don't have to expect something like that in order to get ahead. And to make a long story short, that wasn't enough. She ended up finding some other dude that she could have sex with and going over his house and got kicked out of his place two hours later and got stranded on the street. So it's just like at the end of the day, even if you offer yourself as just being help, people could decide to accept it or not. But if you yeah. change on your position, then that changed who you are as a person. And I couldn't yeah. be involved in that. So she I'm- probably comes from a place where she believes that sex is always a bargaining tool. It's something that like she has to do in order to like get the things that she wants, which is, you know, an unfortunate uh-huh. thing to have learned, but you know, people learn different patterns and uh, that's probably yeah, just how she was raised. She was like, this is like what I had, like there, I don't have any other value in me besides like me being able to give away sexual favors for things that I need. And so she was probably very surprised when you wouldn't take it from her. And I don't know, was she a little bit insulted? I'm, I'm pretty sure she was, but she was also probably um, a little drug infused. So it was just mm-hmm. like, it, it was a reason why she was kicked out of the model house. Yeah. So, and, um, 
and it's cool. I've just I I'll just remain in my position of who I want to be. It's like got to understand your principles versus your values, and principles yeah. gotta be cemented, and your values can change based off of what's going on in the world, but. You know, when you stick to your principles, it, it helps you remember who you are. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Isaiah, you have integrity, and that is an incredibly valuable asset, especially these days. And I think that's a big reason why everybody loves you so much. It's all love. I have nothing but love to give back. <laughs> <laughs> well, Isaiah, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure. Um, I hope to see you in person on set sometime soon. And can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Anything that you want to plug? Absolutely. Um, You can find me on Twitter, of course, at Isaiah Maxwell, I-S-I-A-H. You can also find me on OnlyFans, spelled the same way, and Instagram with Isaiah underscore Maxwell. Fantastic. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. I am shadow banned on both platforms. So I may not come up immediately when you search for me, but I am there. I promise. Isaiah was actually giving me some advice on how to get unshadow banned on Instagram. So I might pick his brain a little bit more on that. (laughs) And if you want to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Also, don't forget that you support my show by supporting my sponsors. So go to manscaped.com and use code Holly for 20% off plus free shipping and keep your balls a hair free, which is something that we all want in life, right? Thank you guys so much for watching or listening wherever you are, and we'll see you next week.